Um, the VPP Infra Event Logger is a tool which is actually fairly lightly used uh, in the data plane. I'm going to show you, um, you know, sort of the net result and why we want it, why we want to have a very lightweight event logger. By very lightweight, I mean you can log events in order of tens of nanoseconds, that it's a binary event logger with an offline pretty printer effectively, and with a pretty nice um, back-end graphical display utility. The, um, the back-end uh, display uh, utility is actually, you know, my history at Cisco is about in 2002, uh, they were silly enough to promote me one time, strictly on the basis of being able to get uh, more than an order of magnitude in WAN protocol scaling using effectively this graphical viewer. What it does is to um, display the event data in, in, in a fairly cool way. I'm going to walk through some slides that show you how in the VPP engine, pitched more at the control plane end of it, that if you're interested in logging events over, over multiple minutes where... Uh, you know, you want to make sense of what's happening and something doesn't happen for a long time. It's fundamentally a very fast logger with a circular buffer of reasonable size. Um, you can easily, you know, you can easily capture a million events and then display them offline in the tooling, one thing and another. So, let's see, oh yeah, I guess I'm here. That's good to know. Um, okay, um, you know, here's some just some re recitations. Uh, the actual event logger code is in VPP infra, VPP infra, elog.ch. Event logging is enabled in an obvious place in uh, main.c. I think Keith actually pointed that as we whizzed on by it. Um, in order to log events, it's fair to say that the um, elog main t that's embedded in VLIB global main, aka, you know, amper mumble there, um, is the place where you want to uh, you want to actually log events now at least at the moment each of the replicas in um, you know in worker threads ends up also having an uh, an elog main t don't use that one and not much is going to happen I will eventually clean this up so that uh, rather than embedding the main t it'll end up with a pointer to it and then when you clone it it'll all be pointing at the one big happy family guy. Uh, this just needs a clean up. Somebody should, uh, somebody should take me to the woodshed for it. The default ring size is 128,000 events. As I said, it, it's command line configurable to really kind of whatever size you want. It starts off on by default. It's so lightweight and there are so few events that are currently enabled, uh, you, won't, uh, you, know, you won't run into any issues as a result of it. It's thread safe. It's a lock-free lock atomic increment uh, to dole out event slots. Uh, typically what one does is to say the ring size is supposed to be a power of two. You take the, um, you know, you do an atomic op to a, you know, to a, a U32 result uh, mod, you know, mod a power of two. And, you know, yeah, formally it's a race, but the truth of the matter is you're not going to log four billion events in the period of time it takes one guy to log one event. So, you know, it's a risk worth taking and it does make it run uh, considerably faster. Each event slot is 32 bytes, aka the cache line size on older CPUs. We could fatten it up to be each event is a full cache line, but I seldom, if ever, actually populate an entire uh, event myself. Um, what does an event uh, capture? It captures a time and CPU ticks out of the, the re, you know, RDTSC instruction on x86-64 or some vaguely appropriate equivalent on, a, on other uh, CPU architectures. Um, one gets an event, an event ID, a track, and when I show you the graphical viewer in a few minutes, you'll understand what tracks are all about. 20 bytes of event data. Logging an event costs less than 100, you know, way less than 100 nanoseconds. And you have to be careful of the observer events. Obser you know, uh, taking a few um, e-logs per frame is, is reasonable. You know, one at the start, one at the end. So you could say, okay, well, how long did this take, uh, you know, based on the number of, uh, the number of packets in a frame? Um, that's exactly the example I'm going to show you is we have built into VPP, although not compiled in typically, uh, some main, you know, main, uh, you know, main loop event logging uh, to show you, okay, uh, you know, how long are the various uh, node dispatch functions taking? I'll show you a pretty interesting thing uh, coming out the end of that. 
Again, it's not appropriate for per packet use when you're trying to process a packet in 50 clocks. That if you put in an event log and you say, my God, the performance is awful, what did I just do? And it'll be, you know, yeah, the event log is lightweight, but there's no such thing as a free lunch and you don't want to eat all of your uh, cookies this way. Uh, the, the command line is pretty simple. Uh, it's, you know, blah, 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 vlib, event logs, nnn, where it'll round it to a power of two. Um, debug CLI is fairly straightforward. Um, you know, event logger clear, save into a file name. For security, when you say uh, event logger save foo, it'll end, uh, the file will end up in slash temp slash foo, and the path name can't have dot dot or slash in it for obvious reasons because the last thing you want somebody doing is wiping out your grub config with this thing. And, you know, one of the things I haven't said too much about is that before um, uh, we open sourced this code, it had a uh, you know, an up close and personal uh, inspection by a uh, white box test team for several months. And this is one of the funny, th funny little things that they found. It said, oh, dude, if you do that, you, you know, we're going to be able to use the debug CLI to wipe out, uh, you know, wipe out something necessary to boot the system. So just don't do that. It's like, yes, sir, I get it. Um, event logger stop will stop collecting data. Restart, pretty obvious. Resize, NNN will clear the buffer, re you know, resize the ring and restart the collector. Uh, there's, an, there's a fairly crude ASCII dump utility one can use um, to, uh, show, you know, to show off what's going on. Now, in terms of code, um, instrumenting the code, um, like I say, it's fine to leave event logs and code disabled. On a case-by-case -case basis, basis low-frequency event logs can be enabled. There really are none turned on at the moment that, uh, you, know, you know, that I've seen. They, they can be useful if you're having issues with link-up downs uh, or with uh, wondering why some control plane-ish thing uh, is, you know, on occasion takes a long time. If folks want to, want to actually look and follow along in some of the code I'm about to look at, um, vlib, 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 elog samples.c, for those, you know, those of you with a source tree, you might want to you know, poke and take a look. Um, this is kind of the canonical, uh, the simplest possible thing to, uh, you know, to log an event. Um, so this is, uh, you know, this is a case of logging you know, a, single, a single datum with uh, you know, with a, with a timestamp. Here's doing four integers. You see uh, the, the interesting d difference between these two is one datum, I4, that format args basically tells the offline pretty printer, here's a format string and here's how much data to fish out of the, uh, you know, the, um, uh, the variable portion of the event itself. Uh, to log four ints, you just literally say, you know, uh, you know, four by percent Ds and I4, 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 something, something like the uh, Central, you know, the Central Valley Freeway, I guess. Um, what, you, what you do is you call uh, the e-log data macro in this case to grab yourself an event. Um, ED is the, uh, you know, is the type that you've kind of explained to the event logger for offline printing, and you splat down the data. There's also a track sample. What this guy is going to do is in the graphical viewer I'm going to show you in a minute, it'll put uh, data on separate, you know, data on basically separate horizontal planes. Um, again, I'll show you in a second what, what this means, but the reason for doing that is say you're doing uh, control plane termination of a lot of sessions. Well, if you want to know why out of 1,000 sessions, 998 of them come up and two don't, uh, you probably want each of the sessions, uh, you know, logged so you can look at it visually, uh, you know, independently. Um, it has support for enums. I'm going, going through these kind of fast because in point of fact, uh, the, the, the sample code's all there. And when you decide you want to use this thing for some reason, uh, you know, you really just have to kind of crib the examples a little bit. The other thing to say is you can obviously mix, you know, you can obviously mix the examples. You can have a mix of enums, um, you know, decimal numbers, uh, actually uh, strings uh, as well. Um, this test command is just the, you know, the, 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 the thing in the, uh, the test code. In fact, you'd be encouraged to actually go fire up this test code. To do that, what you'd want to do is go into vnet uh, makefile.im and add uh, elog samples.c just to the basic vlib package, rebuild, and then the uh, debug CLI, which you'll see at the bottom of that file, 
uh, will just show up and you can actually test it. Now, performance on your laptop not guaranteed. So that's kind of a that's kind of a whirlwind tour of here are some functions you might want to remember where they are and be able to go use as needed. Um, so what's what's the point with this is visualization. Um, when you um, you know again here's the you know test e log sample that's the I've gone and compiled the thing as I just described by you know tickling uh, tickling makefile.am. We can actually try this after a bit. Um, It'll, the, the, you know, the, the sample will generate 50 event logs and so on and so forth. In order to build the, the G2 viewer, which I'm going to show you in a minute in some detail and a much more real example than this, uh, this test toy, um, it's in the source tree. You need a couple of, uh, you need uh, GTK 2.0 dev and libapr1 dev uh, installed. Uh, on Ubuntu, can't tell you what the what the equivalent is on Red Hat because I don't do uh, I don't do CentOS much for this stuff, and you know build the viewer and actually run it. Uh, there's a pretty good wiki page which describes the viewer in some real detail. So you know here's some screenshots from the uh, you know from the test. So here's um, you know one one of the screen gestures which I'll show you live here is a time ruler and. You know, even on a not a not super stupendous computer, uh, the distance between these two event logs is plus or you know is 20 nanoseconds or something. So you're able to log data, at, you know, at a pretty good granularity. Again, this is data from the test program you see in e-log samples. If you look at the code, you can kind of see why this picture makes sense. And there's also a, a handy uh, ASCII dumper. Now, one of the things to say is that I've been, as, as I said earlier, I've been using the uh, viewer since, oh God, 2000 or so. I don't care, you know, the other thing is this is a, a graphics viewer uh, built by, um, you, know, uh, you know, built by a performance, you know, performance geek, not a, not a graphics programmer. So I apologize in advance for the UI. It's something that makes sense to me and I hope people find useful. It's a little bit, uh, it's historical in that um, I invented once upon a time a file format called CPEL, you know, for crazy performance event log format or some such. And one can convert CLib, CLib um, serialization files into this and then use the ASCII dumper that I built. Um, again, the ASCII dumper, the, the timestamps here are hours, minutes, seconds, milliseconds, microseconds. So you can see he's pretty, he's pretty, uh, you know, pretty willing to log seven, eight, nine events in a microsecond. Uh, once, once, you, once you stop taking, taking so many cache misses warming the thing up, it's really damn fast. So that's kind of the end of the canned portion of the exercise. Let's go, um, let's go put this bad boy away and go see if we can find the viewer itself. Uh, there we are. Right. There. Now, this is uh, this is a data shot from a two-worker case, and you remember I was yapping about tracks. Well, each of the each of the worker threads, you know, gets a track. Let's first of all, uh, these are uh, this the uh, the right-hand you know selector window. You just sort of turn off all the events. Let's look, for example, at um, the number of packets in the frames that we're getting from the DPDK. And even though if you look at the time scale, you're looking at 30, you know, 30 milliseconds of data, that's an awful lot of packets went by. It turns out we're logging uh, some number of events per frame, but certainly none per packet. So let's say if we, we zoom in here, now notice um, this tick mark format is meant so that when you have a tremendous amount of data on the screen, it doesn't take forever in a day to paint. So you turn on the, the sort of event IDs here, and now you zoom in, and now we're now we're getting some uh, you know some actual actual information. And this is okay. We got a packet with 56 frames from the DPDK, and the cycle time to do 56 packets was a bit you know was you know plus or minus five microseconds. Um, you know, and this this distance here again you know right mouse click you know it's about one microsecond between the two threads that are doing um, RSS sharing. Now the cool thing. You might say, is, well, why is that interesting? Now, if we zoom out just to the right scale here, what you're going to see is all of a sudden, you know, you get sort of black, but you don't get really totally black. And you'll notice, okay, I see some interesting stuff every once in a while. Now, how, how long is every once in a while? I'm going to say it's three and a half milliseconds. Every three and a half milliseconds, there's some spread between the DPDK input guys that is, that, that's not characteristic. This is, again, I've used this tool and, and its predecessor for 
25 years at least, so I'm pretty good at this sport. And you know, you zoom out and you say, oh, there's a rhythmic pattern. I wonder what's going on there. And then you zoom in to the rhythmic pattern and you say, son of a gun, look right there. You see that, where, where the frame size goes from 69 to, I'll bet you, 128. Remember how I've, I've yapped about the VPP dispatch algorithm being stable, and maybe I haven't said much about it in this, you know, in, you know, in this context, but I, I know in the pre-launch VODs I did say something about it. What's going on here is something's happened on the computer. It seems to be happening every three and a half milliseconds where the frame size on these workers processing in aggregate 20 million packets a second on two of them, the frame size expands for some reason. What was it? Well, three and a half mils doesn't rhyme with the clock interrupt particularly, but I'll bet you if I, you know, if I dig hard enough, I can figure out what was going on. The chances that you're going to see an effect like this with a tool other than this kind of visualization where you're just very regularly logging events and where the event logger isn't such an observer effect uh, vector that, you, that you, all you're seeing is the event logger. Well, this is absolutely real because here you see, okay, we've gone from you know, um, we've gone from a vector size of 69, all of a sudden now we're up to a vector size of 128. There's something pretty real going on there. Is it anything to do with VPP? No, not, you know, not, not directly. Is it something in the background uh, fiddling around and, you know, hitting the caches a little bit? Almost certainly. It could be something to do with the NICs, but you never even notice something like this again because the dispatch algorithm is nice and stable. You know, the vector grows a little bit. It's a little more efficient because of the amortization effects and the vector size, you know, by over here, the vector size just shrunk back to, well, there it's 96. And I think if we, if we watch it for a while, you'll see it back in the 60s. Okay, there's 80. So it, sl it slowly converges back to the equilibrium value. Now it's a cool demo at that level, but Again, you'd find it very tough to ever even see something like this. The, the, the real trick is that, the event, you know, that a, a good swath of data, in this case 30 milliseconds or so of data, that you can then view a, as a whole gives you a real opportunity to understand what's going on in the computation at large. Now, it might take a week's worth of drilling to work out exactly what's going on, but at least you can see the damn effect. Um, so now, if we turn on all the let's let's just let's just highlight one you know one dispatch cycle of the sort of normal case here. Let's go he, here and here, and then zoom in. You know, it's left mouse click, drag, zoom in, and turn on all the events in the world. Well, now you see there's way more going on than than just you know than just two things. In fact, again, if we zoom in here a little bit, you can say, okay, well, what's this? IP4 input no checksum called with 75 packets. And there's back, back with 75 packets. Now if we do this, even though it looks like a great deal of time, it's OK. Um, that looks like 10 nanoseconds a packet, which is not unreasonable to guess. You know, sort of at the prevailing rate that each of these threads is doing about 10 million of something a second. So you know, not unreasonable. And again, the event logger granularity, you know, there you see an interval of 75 nanoseconds. How much of that's the logger? How much of that's the dispatcher? You're now down to the point where, you know, you can know a particle's location or you can know its momentum, but you can't know both of them. That this is really down at the absolute limit of, of, this, of, of instrumentation of kind of any sort that doesn't involve, you know, probing the chip and, and using, you know, $100,000 logic analyzer. This is kind of a software logic analyzer is really what it amounts to. And the visualization, I, f I personally find pretty effective. Other people, you know, uh, may, or, may or may not. The tool itself, again, has been open sourced and you can feed it from anything. You know, if you have a buddy that wants to be able to do, you know, O of 10 million events on a, th on a thousand, you know, a thousand time axes, uh, this tool might be might really be your friend. I'm glad to help people, you know, play with it. I don't use it a great deal in data plane coding. That typically what we do when you're saying, oh, I want to tune this graph node, is I'll go run, you know, perf top and just go find the memory stalls. But for things up a level where you're looking for system effects at the at the millisecond granularity, which are only detectable uh, with this kind of visualization, it's a pretty cool thing to have in your back pocket. So. That's kind of the that's kind of the the hundred thousand foot thing. Do people want to actually go try and try and build up the log sample thing and actually shoot some data and build the build the visualization tool? That's certainly something you can do. Um, you know, I'm I'm glad I'm glad to help folks or whatever. But again, um, it might it might actually be well to look at uh, 
you know, to look at the e-log samples and just go run the, go run the test program. If, if folks want to want a hand actually walking through that, you know, show of hands, folks interested in trying to do that. Folks want to leave. Folks want to throw dead small dead animals, including fish. I've heard that one before. But uh, oh. Oh, it's yeah. Well, let, let's go back to the slide. The slide, the slides, uh, slides Uber Alice for once. I think, unfortunately, I was. No, oh, did I not? Ah. No, I'm right. I'm right at the bottom. Thanks, Keith. Oh, God, my blood pressure just went up to. Okay, so at any rate, here's the. Uh, you know, here are the directions. You'll notice that there's a G2 directory. Uh, you know, in there, and that's that's the that's the viewer. And it uh, the previous slide or so, I think, show. Well, I didn't particularly show how to build the. Uh, the test e-log guy, but it's it's actually way simple. Just go in, uh, you know, vnet makefile that I am, add e-log samples to, you know, add add it to the to the core package and auto reconf it and re, and rebuild the VPP image. Whereupon the the debug CLI, um, sh you know, shown right here will show up. Let me, um, you know, these are you know these at least in Ubuntu. Well, bother, not the word I'm actually thinking. Um, at any rate. Um, uh, you know the uh, you know adding adding a, f a file to vnet make file that I am is pretty straightforward. Rebuild the image. You'll find this test e log sample guy. You know just just do this and then uh, off you go. The wiki write up I think is actually not wholly bad. Open link in new tab. Let's see let's see how bad I how bad I think the write up is. Okay. Uh, it probably is too small, but that's not something I can fix right at the instant. At any rate, um, it has a bunch of uh, you know a bunch of taxonomy and explains how to drive the viewer. Um, I would l if if there are if there are, um, it's a GTK um, you know uh, it's a GTK app. If folks are familiar with that graphics library, a number one, congratulations. B, I'm sorry the code looks like an idiot wrote it and. You know, feel free to fix any you know any bugs or issues you find in it. But um, it it is kind of a cool thing. The write-up's not half bad. I think you should be able to figure out how to do it. And in this case, you know, just to just to point out, you know, belabor the obvious a little bit. Um, this is a, an example of multiple tracks where, from a totally different system, actually iOS XR to be honest about it. I, I was uh, working on. Um, what you know? Uh, what goes on in in the BGP process here? And the BGP process in iOS XR is is heavily multi-threaded. So each of the threads ended up getting its own track. Whereas um, you know I haven't much done that uh, in much done that in the VPP uh, in the VPP image. Uh, the VPP e logs uh, the the main loop event event logs are configured in one of the header files. There's an obvious pound define uh, floating around that says uh, what is it? Uh, vlib main loop e logs. Um, I think you can either uh, e you can either set it in the header file. Uh, Keith, you want to dig up what header files that in? I think it's e logs plural, but I'm not 100% sure. Any rate, um, once upon once upon a time, one of my buddies um, actually added hotkeys. Which is supposedly, you know, circa 1996 Quake-like to tell you how long we've been at this. Anybody remember that? Remember that game? Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, okay. Well, yeah. I figured Ed had put his hand up. Keith, you, you. you uh, can I ask you a question? Yeah. You, you're after the elog uh, dot c dot h there in BGP and the um, actual... I was looking for the pound to find that controls the vlib main, uh, you know, the vlib main, you know, main loop event logs. Oh. Just so that if people want to actually reproduce the the experiment I just did, and you know, and hit and hit the thing with some real traffic, that you should be able to see the same stuff. One thing to say is the main loop event logs. When you when you're hitting the thing hard, it's processing a lot of frames. So it's a, you know, so 100,000 events may only be good for 30 milliseconds at a really high frame rate, especially across multiple multiple worker threads. If you're hitting the thing with five packets a second, you're going to get you know, it, it, it'll log events very, very slowly. Again, I've, I've over the years used this as much for control plane uh, understanding of how things work. You know, it's really easy to see, you know, two second PPP session timeouts in that world. So, at any rate, this is mostly a tool in the toolbox. And every so once in a while, I like to take a look at the main loop event logs to see, you know, are we getting funny events? 
one of the one of the classic ways of having things uh, uh, work not very well at all is if you end up oversubscribing a core that's being asked to process a lot of packets. And at that point, you know, you'll suddenly see, you know, pardon me again for alluding to things uh, 100 million years ago, you're going to see a Nixon gap for like, you know, really a ten, you know, 10 or 20 milliseconds. Yeah, I, you know, you, you can tell who, who the old guys who remember Nixon are, but, uh, you know, the, I'm not going to tell my other Nixon joke, it's bad, but, uh, you know, that's, a, that's actually, a, you know, a really interesting effect you get into with the, with, with the viewer is if you start seeing, you know, not these, not these little tiny, uh, in tiny, you know, gaps we were seeing, but rather, you know, you see 10 milliseconds and you wonder why you're dropping packets like no, nobody's business, like, oh, okay, huh, perhaps I better evict whatever squatters on the thread, uh, you know, on, on the CPU core or on the hyper thread. Um, that when Damian talks some about the uh, multi-core configuration, um, you know, one of the tuning considerations is trying to make sure that, for example, you have VPP running on cores that are adjacent to the I.O. devices, or that you've, you know, if you, if you fail to get that right, you're, you're just looking for a world of crappy performance. And, you know, we try not to make the thing so that it won't run fresh out of the box, but, you know, if you say, you know, you said this would get 20 or 30 million PPFs and it's getting two, you know, you might wonder if you've got, um, you know, a web server parked on the same core by mistake or something, you know, something of that form. Or, you know, and, you know, the jitter and latency numbers you ought to see out of BPP when things, are, when the system itself is configured properly is pretty repeatable and pretty low. That, you know, here, you know, here you, you know, here you realize that you're, you know, you're processing to complete, oh, see, oh, there we go. Uh, that wasn't what I meant. Actually, there's a way around it, which is that. You know, you're seeing, you know, a, a cycle time of less than a microsecond to do 70, 80 packets. And, you know, that's inclusive of, of logger overhead. And there's actually a, a, a reasonable number of guys there. So, anywho, um, you know, that's, 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 the, that's the tool, that's the toy. If people want to hack on it, you know, by all means, uh, I would warn you that although I remember how the vector engine works real well, this graphical viewer is far older. And when you look at it, you'll wonder, you know, but Barrick, what, what about all those vectors? You know, it's like, yeah, it's, old, it's older than my use of CLIB, frankly, that it dates from, you know, 99 or 2000. And, you know, still compiles, still works, so I use it. So that's, that's about what I have to say. Other topics you want to do, Keith? Or? Uh, yeah, maybe now might be a good idea to just briefly talk about um, the hackathon. And without going into too much detail and ruining the surprise, um, the hackathon's going to be Thursday afternoon. Dave, you had some ideas. Do you just want to perhaps rattle off as many as you can remember of some things that are going to be achievable by folks yeah. in a few hours well, that are actually worthwhile doing? One, th one thing that... Um, you know, I had in mind to do with some, you know, um, you know, telemetry uploads that it's actually, you know, we have a, 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 a Ganglia Gmon D uh, module that, you, you know, the people have been building. If you wonder what that Gmod thing was, it's possible to upload uh, to a gang, you know, to a, a Ganglia or Gmetid monitor um, statistics out of the, out of the data plane. One of the ones that I kind of slapped together uh, a draft commit, which we can play with some in the hackathon, is to say, okay, the idea of significant errors, you know, things that an operator would want to know that would want to just have, you know, a, you know, a, gra you know, a graph value show up, that suddenly, if you suddenly see um, source RPF drops all over the place, you begin to wonder, well, okay, what's going on here? And uh, what I did was to sl splat down a bitmap of all of the, you know, uh, you know, limited by the, the total number of errors the system knows how to count, and to say, okay, these are significant errors, you know, you know, you configure it, and uh, to go count those and then upload them. Now, in terms of actually doing the, um, you know, doing the playing, playing around with the fancy GUI, that's one thing. In terms of showing that the data are being accumulated and are ready to be published that way, is, you know, is pretty easily achievable. Uh, the other thing you could say is, you know, perhaps I want a configurable, uh, you know, set of, you know, user probe one, user probe two, user probe three, user probe four kinds of things where you say, okay, I want to assign this, er you know, a certain error counter to, uh, you know, to a probe that's then uploaded. So you say, you know, right at the moment I'm interested in the number of IP6 segment routing packets that are processed. Um, easily enough done, 
uh, by, by just sort of a variation on the theme of the significant errors counter. The stuff is, is relatively easy to hack through. I mean, you kind of take one look at the code and you go, oh yeah, I guess I, you know, second verse same as the first, I know how to do this. So that, that's, that's one, you know, one thought for the hackathon. Um, the other the thing is really just to throw it open for the floor. What, you know, what are people interested in trying? Because uh, building up a whole new tunnel in CAP, if I type as fast as I can as a day and a half's work, you probably don't want to go there. You might want to do something with the MacSwap plugin to give it a Mac filter to say, I'm you know, this is the, on this is the only uh, source Mac address I want to swap, you know, to, to give a little bit of an exercise in building tables. Um, Ed, what's up? Yeah. Um, so, for example, I know we've got some chatter going on on the mailing list, basically by people within 20 feet of each other here, about wanting to do some improvements to the CLI, for example. So getting folks together who want to work on that and helping them get off the ground, even though we know that's not going to be completed here, yeah. also becomes productive. We've had discussions about various other things sort of during breaks that people are wanting to do. So there's a lot of space to figure out the stuff that people are interested in working on and just getting the humans together and a yeah. little bit off the ground. Yeah, that you know, that's all absolutely cool too. Maybe what we really ought to do is, you know, uh, email to some person who's going to collate a list of them, email some suggestions, so we can say, you know, let's just, you know, set people who want to work on X together. You know, here's the list of suggestions we've gotten. You know, uh, you know, uh, kind of almost a fabricated sign-up mechanism, so people can do that. And you know, we'll be, you know, we'll be circulating around to help. Mm -hmm. I think is the right way to look at it. And. You know, again, it's you don't have to finish. You know, this is this isn't an, an exam where you fail the class if you don't if your code doesn't compile at the end of it. So, uh, you know, really, kind of wherever wherever the you know the folks want to take it, I'm, you know, yeah, I, I can something. always invent something to break. But. Yeah. <laughs>